Welcome back to The Urban Monk, Dr. Pedram Shojai, talking about a subject today that is near and dear to my heart. We are talking about rainforests. Um, there's a big arc in the upcoming movie where we followed a company that's uh, working to preserve trees and rainforests and a couple companies that are doing this. And we're looking for any and all opportunities to save A, the clear cutting, and B, you know, once we get kind of a little further along, uh, growing some back and there's some really promising uh, ventures out there that are doing it. So um, it's big and we're going to talk about why it's big uh, for multiple reasons. Uh, uh, with me today is Lindsay Allen who's the executive director of the Rainforest Action Network. She is in San Francisco right now and she's got rainforesty kind of plants behind her and uh, she's been at this with them al alone for eight years. So she's she's been around this block. Welcome to the show. Thank you for having me. Yeah, well, thanks for doing the work that you do. This is this is important. Uh, one of the things um, that is really important in this climate change conversation is you know being able to sink carbon. And so you know some of the stuff that I've heard is obviously the rainforests are number one, and then a lot of people are arguing that the soil and soil sequestration is is number two. And um, those are things that are well within the grasp of things we can fix within our lifetime if we change around some of our, our action behaviors. So uh, we understand you know the importance of protecting forests. Any monkey can understand. You know maybe there's a couple um, in Washington that don't, but for the most part we understand the importance of this, right? Uh, what is making it so hard to fight this good fight? Yeah, I think there are a couple of things. So, um, you know, what we really focus on at Rainforest Action Network is we want to keep fossil fuels out of the atmosphere, so keep them in the ground, and we want to keep forests standing because, as you said, they're an amazing sink. Um, just to talk about it for just a second, in some tropical forests in the world, like one place where we're working in Indonesia called the Loser Ecosystem, it is so biologically dense, and there are these things called peat swamps, which are just supercharged ways to sink carbon and to hold carbon in the ground and to keep it out of our atmosphere. So yes, it's critical for that. What makes it difficult, I think there's a few factors. You mentioned one of them. So we have elected officials who don't understand or because of where they get their, their financial support, they choose not to understand the relationship between forest and climate and carbon. Um, but I think part of it is just people are busy. And so what we do at my organization is we really follow the money and follow the commodities to try and make it easy for people to, to use their own power to influence corporations to adopt better policies. And what we've seen from that is when we work in partnership with communities to shift the behavior of these, these companies so that they're not clear, clear cutting these forests as quickly as possible just to make a buck. Uh, it can have a tremendous impact in protecting these ecosystems. So we're just needing to do it at a bigger and bigger scale. So you were uh, drinking a, a can of uh, Guayaquil, uh, which is one, wonderful, wonderful stuff. I'm a, I'm a big fan of that company. They're one of the uh, best social enterprise examples I've seen out there. And you know, these guys are growing something that's a shade-grown plant that can actually get more money out per hectare than clear cutting. So they're creating a, a financial economic um, statement slash you know business case for saying, hey, why don't we not chop these down? In fact, why don't we grow back some rainforest, this is a good idea. Yeah. Uh, that's one kind of market-driven uh, solution that I'd like to see scale more. Uh, what other examples are you seeing out there of stuff that's promising? Yeah, I mean, you can see something similar with coffee, right? So when you're talking about products that people can use that are grown with the forest, then you don't need to clear it down. Um, one of the, the reasons why it's so challenging is when we take a place like Indonesia, which has one of the largest remaining tropical forests left in the world. Um, what we're seeing is it doesn't necessarily make sense to destroy those places in order to create products, right? One of the things that Indonesia is being destroyed for in terms of their rainforest is to create the cheapest vegetable oil in the world, palm oil. Hmm. So if you said, okay, does it make sense to really put these two things on a scale, destroy critical habitat, carbon sink, beautiful place, biodiverse, last place on earth with rhinos, tigers, orangutans, etc., all living in one ecosystem. Does it make sense to turn that into pulp for toilet paper, paper products, or palm oil? People would say absolutely not. But what we're seeing is because there isn't respect 
for indigenous and community land rights, then companies are clearing these forests as quickly as possible because clearing and planting their crops is the way that they're asserting ownership. It's actually stealing lands from communities and that's the balance that we're really trying to change. So if you say, okay, hold on a minute, don't let these companies charge in and clear as quickly as possible. Let's get indigenous, indigenous rights recognized, right? The, the places where we still have tropical forest standing are in places where communities and indigenous communities have been fighting to protect these places. So let's recognize that, appreciate it. And then oftentimes what we see is there are local commodities, local economics that are just a better use. And you can grow things like coffee, you can do some rubber tapping, you can harvest mate. Um, there are all kinds of crops that grow in the forest and you don't need to clear it in order to, for it to be productive. So palm oil is a big one. I know you know some of the big kind of consumer goods companies recently have gotten um, some flack over their palm oil practices and all this. What makes palm oil a challenge? Palm oil is a challenge. It's now the most popular vegetable oil in the world, and it's the cheapest vegetable oil in the world. And in addition to the challenge that I mentioned around there's not recognition for who owns or should own what pieces of land, it's a little bit like the Wild West. So imagine Wild West companies go in, clear as fast as they can, push communities off their lands, and then what gets harvested, these bunches of little palm fruitlets, get smashed and turned into oil. And then it's really difficult to know, is the oil that I get in a product that I buy at the grocery store, is it from palm oil that came from good practices or bad practices? Hmm. So one of the things that we've really been pushing with these companies, and you know, we have been giving companies flack, um, that's part of our role as RAN, although we also help them move along once they decide to make that commitment. Um, one of the things we're asking them for is to really understand their supply chain and to be transparent about it so that companies, you know, whether you're looking at uh, Kraft or Pepsi, these brands that you know, they're using these products, they should be demanding that their suppliers are not implicit in human rights violations and clearing of tropical forests for these cheap products. So one of the challenges with that is if the consumer, the end user who's you know drinking a can of Pepsi doesn't care, then Pepsi doesn't care, right? Mm -hmm. and, and so how much more awareness do we need to stoke in the people that are supporting these companies to say, yo, I'm gonna stop buying your stuff. You know, don't be a yeah. jerk. Yeah, I mean, we absolutely need to increase awareness. Um, one of the things that we do at Rainforest Action Network is we try to make it accessible and funny, right? So we do things like we take something that PepsiCo was already going to do and we spoof it. So they every year they put out an annual report. This year they created a report that said how they're a good environmental and social steward and we spoofed it. So we did the a similar look and feel. We took their brand and we changed it just a little bit. We connected it with some of the deforestation impacts they're having and then we handed it out right next to the report they already have at the shareholder meeting. <laughs> so that shareholders can say, wait a minute, this is what you're telling me you're doing, Pepsi and CEO Indra, and this is what I hear you're actually doing. So we do the documentation and the research and then we try to make it really easy for people to take action. And what we're seeing across the board is when people have this information, they care. So I think sometimes there's a worry about are people ap apathetic and will we have an impact? We know we're having an impact. Some of the largest companies in the world that use palm oil have already made commitments to increase the way that they're responsibly um, harvesting and sourcing palm oil. So it's just a matter of us continuing that pressure and uh, knowing that our determination will pay off. That's amazing. There, there's momentum, it sounds like, in, on a lot of fronts. Um, and then there's also regression, right? So we just had recently this Paris Accord debacle with President Trump. What's Rand's reaction to that? Um, and what, what do we do about it? Yeah, so our reaction is obviously one of frustration. Um, the President of the United States should not be one of the weakest leaders in the world when we're talking about a global crisis, which is what we're dealing with in terms of climate change and global warming. Um, I think it's indicative of his, his leadership 
and it's problematic. I think the silver lining is that we're seeing a tremendous response. And, you know, maybe where we got a little bit comfortable under Obama, um, we now have this renewed energy, whether it's on the ground and you're seeing communities that are fighting, uh, you know, pipelines that are running through their communities or running across indigenous lands, um, or whether you're seeing, you know, it's, it's uh, Michael Bloomberg announcing new initiatives, whether it's the entire state of California saying we're still going to move forward as though we were part of the global climate agreement. Um, and so part of that, uh, the opportunity is for us to harness that grassroots energy and say, you know, sometimes um, we can have kind of a token president who's problematic. Real change comes from people power. And we as people are not going to accept, you know, this this poor, weak leadership position, we are going to continue to hold ourselves to what we know is possible, which is energy economies are have completely changed. Clean energy is the way of the future. Fossil fuels are over. It's, it's just a matter of time. You know, let's get on with a stable climate future for us that's more economically viable in terms of clean energy anyway. So it's right there in front of us too. Like that's that's the part that gets me is it's it's right at our fingertips. Like we're at the point now technologically where we can do renewable energy. We can start sh shifting over the grid, you know, from transportation to powering our you know our cities and all these types of things. Uh, the the tech is there, but it seems like these kind of dinosaur behemoth industries that have trillions of dollars invested are like, yo, I still got to recoup my investment, so I'm going to buy a president. Right, and so how, how does one, <laughs> which is kind of what happened, uh, hashtag drain the swamp. Um, so, so what what do we do at this point, right? Like, how how do we step in as consumers and and voice this to every company that is part of this problem? Yeah. So one of our taglines at Rainforest Action Network is challenge corporate power, and we see corporate accountability as a critical piece. So especially at a time where corporations are literally trying to buy public officials, right? Where public officials are more beholden to profit and corporate interests than to our interests, our survival as a species, um, we can really take advantage of the leverage that we have as consumers. So we, you know, I talk about we target the worst of the worst. It's the worst extraction companies. You know, we know that coal should not be a viable fuel source anymore for the U.S. or anywhere in the world. It contributes to you know, greenhouse gas emissions and it often contributes to negative community impacts. So let's take all of that information and let's figure out, okay, how do we shift the dial more quickly? How do we shift these companies more quickly than they might naturally want to move? And one example, when we look at the need to keep fossil fuels in the ground, is we see banks, we follow the money, we know that large Wall Street banks are providing the financing that builds out oil infrastructure, you know, the Dakota Access Pipeline, there was a lot of attention to it. Locking in that pipeline means we're locking in decades of emissions because it then makes it profitable to, you know, extract the oil in the tar sands and to, to ship it and refine it and to pipe it through. So. When we look at banks every year, we do, a, we do a report card and we grade the banks. We grade whether or not they're investing in the good alternatives that should be invested in more quickly. Clean energy is, is notable there. Or whether they're continuing just because of you know, bad patterns to invest in these dinosaur companies. What are the banks? Um, you know, this, this is going to be dated information, obviously, for whenever people see this. But right now, who are the worst and who are the like top five and, and bottom five? How's that? Yeah. Um, so it's, it's actually pretty straightforward. And it very, you know, we do a report card. So you can go to uh, RAN.org, R-A-N.org, and you can see, you know, banks that were moving on different issues at different times. So if you're talking about, um, oil extraction, the bank might be different than if you're talking about uh, coal mining. But what we know across the board is that Wall Street banks are really problematic. They're continuing to invest trillions of dollars in dirty energy. And those banks that we're looking at are the banks like J.P. Morgan Chase, Wells Fargo, Morgan Stanley, Bank of America, um, Goldman Sachs, I'm missing someone because there's at least six in the problematic top. 
And when you're looking at financial institutions that are showing us the way forward and the real solutions, you're looking at credit unions that are responsible and accountable to communities, and you're looking at mission-driven banks, banks that challenge the, the, um, the current status quo that banks are only there to make a profit for our shareholders. Banks were designed, right? Money was designed to be a benefit for us as individuals. So let's start harnessing it in that way again. Um, you can see on the spectrum of impact investment uh, investors to credit unions, they just have better investment choices and better options for our future. So this is a, this is a point I want to stay on for a second because this is a, a, something we, we strongly emphasize in our, in our uh, prosperity movie is that where your money sleeps at night makes a big difference. And um, so most people will go buy organic food or, you know, drive a Prius or a Tesla and, you know, feel proud of themselves, but then leave their money at Wells Fargo or Chase, not realizing that they're feeding this parasitic Wall Street energy that's destroying and, and you, know, you know, giving us Keystone XL, right? Mm -hmm. And so connecting those dots and moving our money away really starts to choke out the infrastructure and the power base of these people that are fueling things that are against our best interests. So, and it's not that hard. I mean, it's so easy to move your money into a new bank that that's just like they're nicer anyways. They're cool people. They're like you want to know your bankers at a community yeah. bank. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. I mean, it, we live in a, a current day scenario where our money doesn't even really sleep. They need our money, and it's being used all the time. So, just as in the case of you know, deciding not to buy irresponsibly harvested palm oil at the grocery store when I vote with my pocketbook there. I can vote with my pocketbook in the same way by not putting my money in financial institutions that aren't thinking about my best interests and the environment, um, you know, every time they make financial decisions. So let's look at this in a, in a particular example. I know you guys have taken a big stand against the tar sands and all the stuff going on at Keystone. Uh, Keystone, and you know it's been it's been an up and down ride over there. Um, yeah. And so looking at this politically, looking at this as a conscious consumer, as a conscious banker, and as someone who might be able to get into some advocacy or click some petitions, like what what what's the ecosystem look like? Like how do I how do I win this for my family? Yeah. So when we're looking at tar sands oil, we know that there are a couple of linchpins, right? So starting with the banks, banks are continuing to finance tar sands extraction and pipeline build out. That means you can move your money. If you've already moved your money, you can still be vocal in opposition. You can show up outside of banks. Um, as we saw with Dakota Access, people all across the U.S., all across the globe we're going to their local bank and saying, or the local branch of a, of a large bank, and saying, these practices are unacceptable. And that had an impact. We were literally on the phone with Wells Fargo the day that they found out that the city of Seattle was divesting because the role that they played in underwriting the Dakota Access Pipeline. Take so that. it's having an impact, yeah. So let's continue to do that. We also know that you know one of the benefits with these pipelines is we know the route that we're going through. So there's already massive indigenous opposition when we're talking about the Keystone XL pipeline, when we're talking about another pipeline that the, the oil companies are trying to punch through the west coast of Canada. Um, Kinder Morgan is the company and the, it's the Trans Mountain uh, expansion pipeline. So the benefit of having those routes is we know where to resist them. So let's do everything we can to get in the way peacefully and nonviolently get in the way of the building of these projects because delay means lost money for them. It means they get more behind in their ability to turn a profit. And at some point it won't make economic sense even in the short term for them to build these things. I know, uh, was it Harvard had this big thing where they had to divest from a lot of coal and oil and, and, and so like the student body was like, yo, what, you know, we, don't, we don't want this. Right, yeah. and so we're talking about these enormous endowment funds that are now pulling out of certain areas or sectors of the economy. So it's yeah. like, okay, Goldman Sachs—they have a great reputation. How, you know, you know what I mean? Like, how does one say, okay, well, Goldman Sachs is so powerful they got more money than God? That's not true. How does one pull their money back out of Goldman Sachs? How do you choke them out? Yeah, so um, we don't even actually need to completely choke them out because banks are designed to assess risk once it's acute enough. All we have to do is show that this is getting so much traction 
that it should be one of the top things on, on, in their portfolio to deal with. We're seeing this with Wells Fargo, right? Wells Fargo had the scandal around opening uh, checking accounts in, in customers' names when they didn't know about it. This has been the second scandal around Dakota Access. That means we can go to them and say, you, if you continue to behave in this way, if you don't adopt a policy to avoid financing these, these types of companies, then you're going to lose investments, you're going to lose customers. That momentum is already there. It's a matter of us collaborating with each other to expand that as much as possible. So one of the tools that we have to make things easier is we list the banks that are supporting the Keystone XL pipeline. We list the banks that are supporting the, the Dakota Access pipeline and that are supporting the Trans Mountain pipeline. Right. So once we know the banks, we can have the conversation. We know who needs to be moved, and it's just a matter of time. They, they assess at a certain point that it's not worth it. We saw with the case uh, of coal mining, we started by looking at coal mining in Appalachia. None of the banks wanted to avoid financing it. Right? They thought, oh, it's making money right now. But slowly, we got each of the Wall Street banks to commit to phase out their financial support for that sector. And then we expanded it to coal across the board. So we're, we're now in a place where many people don't know this, but most Wall Street banks already have phased down plans where they cannot finance new coal build out. We just need to get them to the same place with oil. Amazing. Amazing. And so a lot of that is pressure. I know a lot of the this whole concept of democracy that you know we live in, it was all kind of predicated on what was considered by the founding fathers and an enlightened citizenry. Right, which means you know what the hell's going on, so that you yeah. can have a, a say in the matter. So you know, greenwashing and a lot of this kind of corporate, um, you know, propaganda that that's put out there. You know, people don't really know who's even doing the right stuff. Where does one uh, get their information? How does one know that they can trust the information? Yeah. So I'd rec recommend a couple things here. One is to think about what is the incentive for. Uh, whoever the source of the information is. So when PepsiCo says we're great, you know, <laughs> we use only good palm oil, don't worry too much about it, we have a policy, it doesn't matter if there's loopholes and we don't implement it, they, you know, it's, in, it, it's to their advantage to say that. And that's greenwash. And you can, it, there's evidence that it's greenwash because you can go to our site at RAN and we have images and footage and interviews and all kinds of information that just shows you that if you dig a little bit under the surface of their claims, they're not substantiated and they're not making progress based on their commitments. Um, so I would just say, you know, is it the company telling us this information? And if so, then who's providing other information? And a simple Google search will often bring you to organizations that are really challenging some of the greenwashing claims. How big is RAN? How many how many members? Like how many staff do you have? Like how like what, how long have you guys been at this thing? We have been at this <coughs> excuse me for about thirty years. Uh, we've grown in the past couple of years, in particular. So uh, we office in San Francisco, Japan, um, a couple of folks around the U.S., but Japan, uh, the U.K., Indonesia are some of our other big hubs, and about fifty staff but many, many volunteers and online supporters. And um, we make a, you know, we have a saying that we take the network part of our name really seriously. So it's based on a lot of individuals who care enough to be engaged. I love it. So when we're talking about rainforests, um, yeah. where are the major rainforests that you're trying to protect? Because everyone just thinks Brazil, right? Yeah. It, it, you were talking about Indonesia. We haven't even mentioned Brazil yet. So what, yeah. what, are, the, what are the trouble spots? Yeah, so uh, Brazil's a good place to start. If you think about um, the equator of the globe, that band is where you find tropical forests. And there are three big intact tropical forest areas left in the world. So the Amazon basin uh, in South America, which includes a big part of the biome is in Brazil. Um, you keep going around, you have that belt that goes through Africa, Africa the Congo basin rainforest. And then you keep going around and you get Indonesia and uh, Papua New Guinea. So those are the three big areas. Um, they're all important for different reasons. So as I mentioned, we've really honed in on Indonesia because we work at the intersection of human and indigenous rights, 
uh, climate and making sure we're reducing emissions that lead to, to climate change and rainforest protection. So you have millions of people in Indonesia who don't have their rights recognized and you have active clearing and burning of those forests. You have critical species that are found nowhere else on world, in the world uh, and the products are being turned into pulp and paper and palm oil. Then you look at Congo Basin, you have a lot of logging uh, is still an issue. And in the Amazon, it's logging, beef and soy are big drivers. Yeah. So the companies that are buying the, the paper or you're manufacturing, selling the paper and making this palm oil, do we know, are these American companies, are these people that we already, like, is there a lineup on who's doing this stuff? Yeah, oftentimes there's a, a more regional or local company um, that has a bit of a monopoly on the market. So in the case of Indonesia, there's two big companies that are pulping for us to turn it into paper. It then goes to China. Um, but oftentimes what we find is, as I said, we follow the commodities. We find that it goes into uh, multinational companies. Many times they started in the U.S. Um, a couple of years ago, we really looked at kid books that were being produced from destroyed rainforest in Indonesia. We said, okay, we're going to name the top 10 global publishers of these kids books. And one of the 10 who was very slow to move was the Disney, Walt Disney Company. Um, and most folks might not realize they are globally the largest children's book and magazine publisher. So we said, okay, that's where we need to start. We negotiated with them for 18 months to adopt a global policy. And what happened was to implement their policy, they then had to go to those factories in China, and those factories in China had to turn around and go to the companies that are responsible for clear cutting on the ground and say, you know, if you do this, we can't put it in these products. So that's how we start to see whole sectors change to move away from these problematic commodities. So what happened with that? Is there like a fairy tale ending to that, or are we still uh, There is a little bit of a fairy tale. <laughs> yeah. Um, so, you know, as I said, they were resistant. Uh, one morning at their headquarters in Burbank, um, activists dressed as Mickey and Minnie chained themselves to the executive gates so that they couldn't get in to park in their parking garage, which of course created a backup on a freeway and a helicopter circling over and a uh, front page LA Times expose on why Mickey and Minnie were there holding signs that said rainforest destruction is no fairy tale. Uh, and that was really the last step that they needed to begin these negotiations. We had executives in our office within a week and there was some really strong leadership internally at Disney. They understood what was at stake. They took seriously their role to be a leader. Um, Disney, of course, as with every company, still has to always be improving on how they're implementing policies, but it's a really significant policy and it's one that we still use with as a model for other companies. I love it. I love it. What, what's on the horizon? I mean, there are so many companies, there are so many places that the world needs help. Like, what are you guys focused on in this next 18 months? Yeah. So when we look at keeping fossil fuels in the ground and keeping forests standing, we know that we do need to move the financial sector away from supporting fossil fuels. Um, the movement is ready and vibrant around resisting pipelines and resisting extraction of oil from the tar sands. So that'll continue to be a really big focus. And then, of course, keeping forests standing, as I said, we're really focused on Indonesia. We need to continue to see more progress on palm oil. PepsiCo is one of the large global laggards that has so many loopholes in their policies that it, it renders it useless. So we need to see them move, and that will remove a domino um, because other companies are standing behind them and refu refusing to move. And then we're also following the money on the forest side. So we've started to release all of the banks that are supporting deforestation in Southeast Asia, whether it's being driven by uh, rubber plantations, pulp, uh, palm oil plantations. Um, so we're starting to increase the awareness around that as well. So are these banks stateside that are supporting some of these industries internationally as well? Uh, so you can find that the banks that you would recognize the name for, Wall Street banks, are implicated globally. And then in addition, when we're looking at deforestation in Southeast Asia, we see a number of banks from Japan, uh, a little bit from China, a bit from Indonesia, Malaysia, uh, and then of course some European banks. Got it. And so do you have a list of all these banks as well? 
We do. Uh, if you go to Rand.org, you can look at our forest finance pages, um, and there's more information than you probably would ever want on bank. Yeah, well, not me. I want I want a lot because... <laughs> yeah, maybe not you. Maybe I'll, yeah, well, because yeah. this is what happened is as we started looking at economic democracy and, you know, changing where you spend and your spending habits, you know, it just occurred to me that the roll up on this is like, but wait a minute, you leave all your money at this bank and the bank does whatever the hell it damn well pleases with it and creates a world that I don't want. Right. Yeah. And so, you know, what gives them the right to spend my money in a way? It's like, oh, wait, I did. You know, I left them my money, and so I am absolutely ultimately responsible for, for the destruction of the rainforest if I'm leaving my money with one of these banks. Absolutely. Yeah, that's heavy. And, you know, it's like I got young kids. Like, you look at, you look at wanting a better future for them, and then you just, these are the blind spots that we don't really think through is, yeah. you know, where our money goes. Even if it's like a life insurance, and there's so many other places where money is parked that gets right. invested in places that we probably wouldn't agree with if we knew. Yeah. You know, one of the other places where money sometimes gets parked that is, is getting more attention, um, as you mentioned, the divestment movement, uh, where large institutions have started to pull money out of fossil fuel companies. Um, we're also seeing people questioning, okay, my 401k, my ROA, uh, IRA, like where's my retirement money sitting? And there are some new tools, um, some of our partner organizations, Friends of the Earth, and As You Sow, spelled S-O-W, they now have tools where you can go on and you can enter what your mutual fund is and you can know exactly which companies they're supporting. So you can decide to have fossil fuel free funds, you can decide to have uh, forest destruction free funds. So that's another great tool to be thinking about in addition to banks. And one of the best parts about this is I started talking to a number of the banking partners that like are doing the conscious stuff. You know, we have New Resource Bank and Aspiration yeah. Bank. A bunch of these guys are, you know, in our yeah. films and, and just, you know, nice people that we've been talking to. Is some of their portfolios, you look at some of their, their um, investment portfolios, they're performing in the top 1% period. And so what that means is, you know, not only does this make good sense for the planet in the future if you care to, you know, live, uh, it actually makes good financial sense. So, you know, you're investing in some of these bigger banks that are actually giving you less returns and destroying the planet. It's just, it, it makes zero sense to keep your money there. Yeah, exactly. The, the Coalition for Ethical Banking um, has released studies that show exactly that when these, uh, you know, sometimes considered alternative banks, but mission value-based banks really are thinking about long-term profitability. They're making better economic and financial decisions, which intuitively makes sense, but sometimes we then trust these really big banks to be doing the strongest risk assessment, and it's just, it's not the case. They're making worse decisions that return less profit for individuals as well. That's it, that's it. Look, I am such a fan of the work that you're doing. Uh, you please keep it up however we can help you. My listeners, my viewers, uh, what do you think uh, is the number one thing for them to do right now? Like if they could just take an action right now, what would it be? Yeah, so I'm gonna cheat a little bit and say to develop a practice where every day you think about essentially how you're pay paying rent on the planet. So what is one thing that you do to give back, um, whether it's moving your money, whether it's uh, going and supporting petitions, whether it's going out into the streets and um, supporting all of the movement energy that's really vibrant right now. Just think about and decide and think about it as a practice. It's something we can each do every day. I love it. I love it. What's It's uh, ran.org. That's right. Rainforest Action Network. And yeah. um, look, I'm, I'm a big fan. Uh, I would love to have you back as things come up. Just let us know. Um, you know, you get something hot on your news desk. I mean, we're in. This is our planet. We got to do this together. That'd be great. Thank you so much for having me. It was great. Thank you. Thank you. And listening to this or watching this, I want you to go to rand.org right now and look up if your bank is one on, on the naughty or nice list and decide what makes sense for you. And uh, we're, we have a, a ton of uh, research and resources that we're also kind of like digging up on the banks that are doing cool stuff. Look at their list, look at our list. There's a lot happening in this space. Don't sit idly and don't let your money sit idly. It's time for us to guide the direction of the future if we wanna have one. I'll see you next time.